morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Carol Champion, Director of Industrial Engagement at uh, Ontario Centres of Excellence. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and welcome to Discovery. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of Gowlings, the sponsors of this presentation theatre. I'm delighted to welcome you to this panel discussion, The Innovation Souffle, Raising Ontario's Clean Tech Capacity with Creative Energy Infrastructure Renewal. Meeting Ontario's energy demands over the next 20 to 30 years will require unprecedented expansion and renewal of the province's electricity, natural gas, and transportation fuel infrastructure. Today, this panel will discuss how changes to policy and research and development can take advantage of Ontario's significant pipeline infrastructure to make these improvements, resulting in lower costs, improved reliability, and lower environmental impact for consumers. I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for the session, David McFadden, partner Gowling Lafleur Henderson, LP, and a member of the firm's board of trustees. He acts for corporations, municipalities, and utilities involved in the generation distribution, transmission marketing, and financing of energy. David was recently appointed by the Ministry of Energy to the three-person Ontario distribution sector review panel. He is a member of the Smart Grid Forum in, in Ontario, uh, which is run by the independent electricity system operator, and is a member of the Council for Clean and Reliable Electricity. Welcome, David, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to the Innovation Souffle. Uh, I was preparing my notes for this event on Sunday afternoon, and I told my wife, she said, what, what are you preparing? I said, Sunday, the Innovation Souffle. And she said, well, would you please find out how you can stop souffles from collapsing. That would be most useful. Um, now, I don't know if we're going to get onto that today, but what we do want to make sure is innovation doesn't collapse. So that is the topic of our concern. Now, we're fortunate to have with us three really excellent individuals, leaders in the development of innovative ideas in the energy sector. What I'm going to do to, to, in the interest of time is I'll introduce them all three at once, and then each one of them will come up in the order in which I've introduced them to make their presentations. I think that's a little more efficient than coming backwards and forwards. Anyway, our first panelist will be Dan Goldenberg, Executive Director at Energy Technology Innovation Canada, a graduate of the Master's Program of Columbia University in New York City from the School of International and Public Affairs. Dan started his career in 1984 as an Assistant Vice President with the CIBC in New York, specializing in real estate credit and origination, not normally a thing that you'd think of in getting involved in the energy sector. Well, anyway, in 1992, Dan saw the light, moved away from the financial sector when he became a director of green buildings for the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, a position he held until 1997. During this time, he also served as a member of the board of directors of the Toronto District Heating Corporation. Dan then worked for some 15 years as senior advisor to the Canadian Electricity Association before assuming his current position as, an ex as Executive Director of the Energy Technology and Innovation Canada, an initiative started with the support of the Canadian Gas Association. ETIC is focused on gas innovation in transportation, integrated community energy solutions, industry, and renewable natural gas. So Dan, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Our second panelist, is Chuck Smirlo, Vice President, Alternative and Emerging Technology for Enbridge, Inc. Chuck holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Purdue University, an MBA from the University of Chicago, and recently secured his CMA professional accounting designation. Before joining Enbridge back in 1998, Chuck was with Amoco and Ford Motor Company in planning, treasury, and operations capacity. Prior to his current assignment with Enbridge, Chuck was Vice President of Planning and Business Development, where he directed Enbridge's strategic planning process, the Corporate Economic Evaluation Group, and Pathfinder's effort. 
In addition to his day-to-day -day executive responsibilities with Enbridge, Chuck serves on the advisory boards of the University of Alberta's Center for Applied Business Research in Energy and the Environment, and on the University of Calgary's Schulich School of, e of Engineering. So welcome, Chuck. And our third and final pa panelist is Sean Conway, who's chair of the board of directors of the Ontario Centers of Excellence and a public policy advisor with Gowlings. Now, Sean has quite a remarkable career. He secured his MA in history from Queen's University, and he virtually left convocation, ran in the provincial election of that year, and was elected to the Ontario legislature in 1975. He then went on to serve in the Ontario legislature for 28 years, and by the end of that time, he was the dean of the Ontario legislature. During his time as MPP, Sean served as a provincial cabinet minister in the ministries of education, colleges and universities, skill development. He also served as minister of mines and government house leader. Now, when he wasn't on the government benches in the opposition, he served as energy critic for the official opposition for many years. Sean left the legislature in 2008 and became a fellow at Queen's University School of Public Policy as well as becoming a public policy advisor with Gowlings. Last year, Sean joined Ryerson University as a visiting fellow of the Center for Urban Energy. And I'm sure many of you have seen Sean as a public policy affairs analyst on radio and on television. Now, Sean became my successor as chair of OCE in 2010 and has done a tremendous job in that position. So welcome, Sean. Okay, I'd like to call upon Dan then to come forward to make his presentation. Dan. Thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you for the panelists and um, for the OCE for inviting me. So I am uh, going to talk to you a bit about innovation in the natural gas industry sector, and um, I want to talk about how the uh, natural gas industry is collaborating to move forward on innovative and uh, very interesting new technologies. Um, I guess I have to do this. So first, a little bit of a background about uh, natural gas. Um, ETIC is uh, a creature, if you will, of the uh, Canadian Gas Association, which represents uh, the industry uh, nationwide. And um, basically, there's about 6.2 million natural gas customers, which touch on about 20 to 25 million Canadians. And so, as you can see, we're a coast-to-coast -coast, um, entity. And uh, natural gas actually represents over 30% of Canada's energy end use, so it's a, a significant portion of the energy that we consume and not often thought about amongst the various sectors, which I'll point out. So, as I mentioned, um, natural gas is one of our leading export products or commodities. We uh, export about $25 billion of natural gas to the United States. Um, we have an abundant supply of at least 100 years of natural gas in Canada, and recently we found a, a great deal of unconventional supply, which many of you may know as shale gas. It's a clean fuel, uh, which burns a lot cleaner than uh, coal, and uh, has about half the carbon emissions. It's affordable, it's versatile, and uh, it's safe. So what do we do with this? Well, first let's take a look at Ontario and see what the energy end use is. What you'll see from this slide that was put together uh, by my colleagues is that natural gas uh, accounts for over one third of the energy end use in Ontario. And if you compare that to the primary electricity supply of 18%, you can see how significant natural gas really is in our economy. This is an important slide for indicating how natural gas pipelines can be leveraged in Ontario. I have this put together because I think it's a really important slide. What it shows is the, uh, the investment that goes into natural gas at the transmission and distribution level and the, uh, the total amount of uh, capital that goes in versus, uh, w which is approximately $3 billion in the last uh, year and represents over 33% of energy, en energy demand. When you compare that, for example, to $20 billion on the electricity side, which on the TND side represents about 18% of energy end use demand. So you can see the leverage you can get from the natural gas utility industry. So 
over the last few years, research and development has not been as abundantly uh, um, uh, possible for either the electric or the natural gas industries. This is why ETIC was created. It was really meant to be a collaborative exercise among the natural gas utilities to bring together their in-kind expertise and their capital and to work to facilitate demonstration. So on the research, development, and demonstration side, we're on the demonstration side of innovative energy and use technologies across various sectors, which I'll talk about. And what we try to do is bring that collaboration together and broker the investment into these technologies. Um, there are obviously other barriers, which uh, I'm not going to talk about today, on the, uh, that could be uh, potentially difficult to implement some of these technologies. But you know, we're available for some questions later on. So what ETIC plans to do is speak to the uh, advocacy and awareness of these different technologies and support them. Uh, we're working on things like technology roadmap exercises with the federal government, um, on things like renewable natural gas. We uh, plan to uh, publicize our uh, projects that we're going to be uh, bringing into fruition and support various forums and workshops along the way. So in essence, we are going to be a strategic enabling uh, collaborative, if you will, uh, and an industry advocate for natural gas. So some of the areas that I'm going to speak to are the, the four project uh, concentrated areas that Dave McFadden alluded to when he introduced me. The first one is integrated energy uh, community systems. And with that, we're basically looking at uh, a community in its entirety and looking at the various technologies that we could deploy, such as thermal metering, combined heat and power, uh, district energy, all of these types of technologies can be brought to bear in any kind of community. Remote communities come to mind because obviously they're off-grid. Another area that we're going to focus on is renewable natural gas. And this is basically taking advantage of the abundant organic supply that we have across Canada, uh, various waste uh, uh, products, and um, looking at technologies like anaerobic digesters, landfill to gas, and um, capturing that as opposed to emitting the methane into the atmosphere, which has a 21 times uh, a carbon dioxide um, effect on the uh, atmosphere. So these are, this is a, a, an important area for us, and, and there are barriers to this, but we hope to bring this into, uh, into fruition in a big way. If you look at this slide, um, it basically speaks to how you can integrate things like renewable natural gas, uh, combined heat and power, and using the distribution network of, of the natural gas pipes, which are already in place, bring that into the community. So this is a really an excellent slide that sort of illustrates all of these different things that I'm going to be talking about and how they can come to bear within a community. Another area that we're going to be focused on is transportation, trying to bring new transportation technologies uh, using natural gas, specifically focused on the heavy-duty diesel truck uh, industry. Uh, which is very significant because even though it represents only 4% of all the vehicles on the road, it actually uh, accords us about 30% uh, of all greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So it's a significant uh, target for trying to bring cleaner fuels, such as uh, compressed natural gas and LNG, to bear. Another one would be return to fleet vehicles, where we see all kinds of fleets out and running about. Um, instead of using diesel, instead of using gasoline, they could use compressed natural gas. Um, and then finally, another area that I've been uh, looking into recently has been marine fuel uh, for LNG, and this is an area which hopefully will grow as well in Canada. Uh, and then finally, the last area that we're going to focus on is industrial processes, improving uh, combustion efficiencies, capturing uh, emissions from uh, various plants, and obviously, given all the industry uh, that we have in Canada, this is a very, very important uh, area for ETIC to focus on. It constitutes about 40% uh, of all use of natural gas in Canada. So this is an area that we're uh, going to be spending quite a bit of time on uh, to see how, uh, how more efficiency can be brought to bear within various uh, uh, different industrial sectors, from mining to, to steel um, to uh, chemical, uh, et cetera. One example of a project we're doing on the energy and use side is the next generation water heater. This is a collaborative uh, with Enercan as a sponsor, uh, Natural Gas Technology Center, NGTC out of Quebec, uh, being the program administrator. 
And essentially, we've got almost 100 water heaters of different kinds of technologies uh, across 10 different pilot sites, four provinces in Canada. And this is underway, and we are uh, uh, looking at collecting the data at this time and evaluating uh, the performance as well as the customer satisfaction related to these various different types of technologies. Role of natural gas in smart grids. We, uh, we have a project, an international collaborative underway. Uh, that's another area that ETIC is focused on. We have um, counterparts in the United States as well as in Europe. In this project, our partner is GDF Suez, one of the largest utilities in the world. Uh, the the uh, Stony Brook University uh, Advanced Energy Research and Technology Center, uh, NRCAN I mentioned, and Saskatchewan Research Council. And here we're looking at the uh, how we can use micro-combined heat and power along and couple it with a, a battery for electric vehicle charging. So this is another example of a very innovative technology not yet commercialized that we're, uh, we're attempting to demonstrate and get data on. So that's it in a nutshell. I'm finishing my talk a little bit ahead of time because I look forward to the questions. Thank you. That was great, Dan. And thanks, David, for the introduction. I'm Chuck Smirlow with Enbridge. And today, uh, what I'm going to talk to you is uh, why a pipeline company is interested in green and renewable energies and chat a little bit about our existing wind and solar programs, but then spend more time discussing our uh, new uh, alternative energy platforms and focus a little bit on the innovation that we've done in electricity storage, which is our most recent Pathfinder investment. Uh, Enbridge is not always a, a household name, uh, but we're a substantial organization. We have about $34 billion in assets, almost 9,000 employees, and, and known primarily as operating the world's largest liquid pipeline operation, and perhaps better known here in Ontario as operating Canada's largest natural gas distribution company. But also, we have been increasingly involved in other forms of, of energy delivery, including electricity transmission and the green and alternative energies that I'm going to elaborate on today. But first of all, uh, why are we into this? And, and I think right off the bat that this kind of business model is, fits into the, the low risk model that we employ in our pipelines. It is uh, part of our desire to own and operate energy infrastructure. And these investments um, can be structured to offer that kind of risk return profile. Uh, and where the green attributes are recognized, there's attractive returns available. We're also motivated by corporate social so responsibility. We believe that organizations have the obligation to be socially responsible. And in fact, we have the specific uh, goal to generate a clean kilowatt hour for everyone that we consume, which is quite a bit because we move a lot of fluids. Uh, we also recognize that there's going to be a societal transition to renewable energy over the next 50 years, and we want to be around for that long. We've, uh, we've been around for 150 years now already and, and hope to be around as society trans, uh, uh, transfers its interest from hydrocarbons into renewables. Uh, our model has been to partner with uh, entrepreneurs and innovators and um, work with them who have taken some of the early risk of this so that we can embrace it uh, to become the long-term owner and operator of that infrastructure. Now, to that end, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to have a, a role in establishing our wind and solar businesses uh, about 10 years ago. And that's grown to the point that we have over $3 billion deployed in wind and solar businesses today. We have 1,000 megawatts of operating wind power in eight projects uh, across Canada and the United States. And following that, uh, we've become a major player in solar photovoltaic projects. Uh, and in fact, we have 150 megawatts in Ontario and Nevada and three projects, uh, and among them is the largest solar voltaic project in, in North America. Uh, more recently, we've been trying to diversify those green energy platforms, and uh, we have our first investment, which we hope will be a lot more, in uh, geothermal power. A lot of advantages uh, over wind and solar in that it's 24-7 renewable clean power. It doesn't exist everywhere. You have to be where the temperature is high. 
Uh, but where it does, it's a very attractive form of power. And also more recently, a underexploited type of power is small hydro, run of the river hydro, that doesn't require the construction of big dams. Uh, and in fact, there's been a recent uh, innovation in these very low head turbines, very small water drops, that enables us to use very small facilities like water irrigation, uh, water control, water level control dams, of which there are like 18,000 in North America, weirs and irrigation dams that uh, we can now use these types of uh, turbines that look a lot like a big room exhaust fan and put them into the existing structures and derive green, green power from structures that are already established for other purposes. Some of the other uh, technologies that we've been developing and hope to, to, to develop further include our fuel cells. Uh, fuel cells is like a continuously fueled battery that uh, electrochemically converts uh, energy rather than uh, combusting that energy. And right here in Toronto, we own and operate Canada's largest stationary fuel cell, a 2.2 2 .2 megawatt facility enough for 1,700 homes that doesn't require a separate in, uh, hydrogen infrastructure. It runs right on the natural gas uh, that exists in our system. And uh, the, the picture there at the top is right outside of our executive offices here in Toronto. We're also developing waste heat to power, which is taking the waste heat associated with our compressor stations. And in our Alliance pipeline, we have four five megawatt projects already that capture that waste heat and turn it into clean electricity. And in addition, we have some Pathfinder investments in an entrepreneurial startup company called Genalta Power that is attempting to develop much, much smaller scale waste heat recoveries so that we can use it on a wider variety of industrial facilities. Some of the other things that have been uh, developed right here by uh, Enbridge Gas Distribution includes the use of compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas for long haul trucks. Uh, there is a huge corridor for trucks that I illustrate on the map below uh, between Quebec and Windsor uh, that we could utilize natural gas if only we had the right kind of fueling infrastructure established and could achieve things like a 15 to 25 percent reduction in the greenhouse gas uh, being utilized by those vehicles if we were to switch to, to natural gas. Um, and not only is it greener, but because natural gas is much less expensive on a BTU basis than, than liquid fuels are these days, uh, it would give us uh, a 15 to 30 percent uh, cost reduction in addition to the meaningful greenhouse gas reductions, uh, particularly al along those heavy uh, truck use corridors. One of the other approaches that we've been taking here at Enbridge is to try to find not only pure renewables, but to find ways of making existing hydrocarbons cleaner than they have been. Uh, to that end, we have been a leader in Alberta, particularly, in the carbon dioxide capture, uh, transportation, and sequestration. Uh, we led some industry consortiums that looked at storing this carbon dioxide back deep into the earth from which it originated uh, in deep saline aquifers. And we're currently involved in a project in Saskatchewan which is attempting to capture the carbon dioxide from a coal-fired plant and then to transport it to a deep saline aquifer uh, more than two kilometers under the ground. One of the other things we've been attempting to do is to make better use of natural gas where it can't be used now by transporting it, not by liquefying it in these big cryogenic LNG tankers that you may have seen, but by using existing technology just to compress it into a coiled pipe in a ship as illustrated there on the bottom photo on the right. And that would enable a lot of facilities that are now burning bunker fuel to switch to natural gas, giving them both cost savings and again, to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases associated with uh, burning fuel oil rather than natural gas. We've also been looking for ways of making the oil sands cleaner. Right now, uh, they use steam-assisted gravity drainage for a large part of the so-called in situ or in place extraction. And we've been looking at ways of reducing the greenhouse gas footprint of that by uh, replacing the natural gas combustion to create steam with using a solvent uh, that dissolves the oil out of there rather than melting it uh, out of the, the resource. Uh, 
Some of our recent investments here in Ontario, just coincidentally, have been with uh, Morgan Solar, a company, a startup company here in Toronto, that is looking at ways of reducing the cost of uh, solar photovoltaic to the point that they think that they can produce this now at eight cents a kilowatt hour, which would be competitive with brown power without any subsidies or without any recognition of the green power attributes. Uh, we've also uh, made a, our most recent investment in a Mississauga-based company called Hydrogenics, uh, which is developing large-scale electricity storage using elect elect uh, elect uh, uh, hydro electrolysis of water, converting it into hydrogen, and then storing our gas system. And in fact, I'd like to elaborate on this last one a little bit more in my last slides. Uh, you know, up to now, uh, as this slide kind of illustrates, there have been kind of an independence, uh, a separation between the, the big energy grids, like the electricity grid and the natural gas grids and our transportation fuels. And it would be a lot more efficient if we could integrate them and link them. And that's what we're attempting to do with this effort in the, the water electrolysis, in, is to take some of the facilities that have been created for the natural gas infrastructure and use them to make the electricity grid more efficient. And how we go about doing that is to take that off-peak electricity and convert it to hydrogen through the electrolysis of water. Most people have done that in our high school chemistry class, but we would do it on a really big scale. And part of the enabler on this is that people have now learned to use fuel cells kind of in reverse to electrolyze that water into hydrogen much more cheaply and effectively than they've been doing in the past. We then take the hydrogen that's being created and we blend it in with the natural gas, in with the methane that's already in our, in our gas grid. And we'd store that uh, in the caverns that we use for natural gas storage now or in the pipelines itself. And then bring that blended gas back out, convert it to electricity, again, using existing combined cycle gas turbines uh, to create electricity when and where we need it. And I think the advantage of that is that the natural gas system, which right now is, is independent, not linked, actually has the scale to, to store that surplus renewable and nuclear power that exists in the transmission system now and is oftentimes inefficiently used. You can stabilize the grid and it create a lot of cost efficiencies too by, by utilizing the existing storage and the existing uh, gas power plant without having to create whole brand new pieces of infrastructure. Not only does it store it time-wise from three o'clock in the morning where there's not a lot of power to the peak morning and rush hours, uh, evening rush hours, but we can store it seasonally from when you need it, from the, from the uh, winter time or the, the shoulder months uh, into when the electricity is really needed to run the air conditioning load. Uh, and we can also use the pipeline system as a transmission network uh, to avoid the kind of congestion necessary with big transmission, electricity transmission projects. So in conclusion, um, we, we can develop new ideas, new technologies and innovation utilizing the existing low risk model we had. And, and bring value within our structure to our shareholders uh, to have attractive returns, uh, to provide us with substantial opportunities for new organic growth, uh, to bring in a variety of diversified green energy platforms, and to take advantage of the cost efficiencies associated with using our existing infrastructure, uh, all of which we think is contributing to our neutral environmental footprint objective which is both good for our shareholders and good for society at large. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. Let me just say, I don't think you can see the clock, but Chuck <laughs> delivered that. We have 12 minutes. He delivered that in 11 minutes and 59 seconds. And, uh, not only was the content excellent, but I've rarely seen even a great pilot bring it in on quite that, uh, on quite that precise a uh, schedule. Well, Dan and Chuck uh, were models of, of, of diplomatic uh, presentation. I'll be slightly different, not because I want to be, but I feel the need to be in, in this respect. Uh, I'm going to come at this question of innovation uh, in the energy infrastructure space uh, from the point of view of a, uh, a beaten-up public policy person. 
um, and, uh, and be hopeful nonetheless, but uh, let me just make some observations from that perspective. And by the way, I think both Chuck and, and Dan had a lot of very, very good content. There's hardly anything there I saw that I would disagree with. But as, as Chuck was working through his, I kept thinking, great, great. Now, can I sell that to my shareholder, having been in the uh, town square for perhaps too many years? I want to say some things about, uh, about this whole question of, of innovation in the, uh, in the energy space. We Canadians have been very good at that for a long time. Necessity truly is the mother or father of invention. And when uh, the non-Aboriginals uh, came here uh, hundreds of years ago, we had a lot to learn from our Aboriginal friends. And being um, European, most of us in the beginning, we had to contend with a, um, a sub-Arctic climate, very inhospitable um, most uh, winters. And not surprisingly, Canadians got very quickly good at innovating in areas like energy and transportation and communications because sprinkle a few million people across this vast and magnificent land and not surprisingly uh, you will get uh, very um, very good at certain things if you're going to survive. So I want to make the point that if I look at the sweep of the last 100, 150 years, but just even the last 100 years, Canadians <coughs> certainly have a lot to be proud of for their innovation capacity uh, in the energy space. There is a problem, however, with the um, land in which we find ourselves. Providence, in some ways, has been too good to us. Uh, the culture of plenty has made Canadians, I think especially my generation and younger, a little um, immune to um, some of the realities that our friends are talking about. And, and I'm deadly serious. It, it took me a while before I realized that it was kind of pointless talking to Canadians about uh, the European or the Asian uh, realities because if you're my age, all you know is that energy was always available with a little bit of an exception in the 1970s. Uh, but the idea that the lights wouldn't come on, the furnace wouldn't work, the trains wouldn't operate, it's just beyond comprehension. Go to England, go to Japan, go to other, most other parts of the world, oh, scarcity uh, is a reality with which uh, they've had to, to contend. I think the culture of plenty is an issue today because, and I see some smart young people, some of whom have left maybe knowing what was coming, um, I think if you are 50 years of age and younger, uh, there is a debate to be had soon. What constitutes a public good for us today? Much of the infrastructure we have that I grew up with was the product of my parents' and my grandparents' generation. Let me tell you, my parents were born in 1917 and 1922. They generally didn't need a lecture about the sacrifice that was required to create a public good. My late father died at 93, and I think he began to think towards the end that his kids and his grandchildren were taking some things for granted that uh, perhaps they shouldn't be taking for granted. And I say that quite, quite seriously. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. One of the other things we teach in Canadian universities is that energy, first of all, we teach that Canada and many of the provinces are a highly regional political culture. Have you heard that lecture, some of you? You'll certainly hear it if you go to many of the, uh, the uh, political science courses taught around the, uh, the country. I think it's true. One of the distinguishing characteristics of the Canadian polity is its regionalism. And in my experience, nothing takes you to that most sensitive part of the Canadian political anatomy faster than an energy debate. If you're an Albertan, the phrase national energy policy excites you in ways that are hard to explain to somebody in North Toronto. It's kind of like, you know, people in Montreal, what do you mean these Albertans and Manitobans don't believe the, Cana the building the Canadian Pacific Railway was a national dream. Oh, it certainly was if you were in the Toronto-Montreal corridor, but if you were a rural person in Manitoba, it was more a nightmare than a dream. So we have to be, I think, very cognizant about some of these sensitivities, especially when we talk about energy infrastructure. Let me say something that is so obvious that probably needs not to be said. 
The most dramatic thing occurring in Canada today, demographically, is we are rapidly becoming an urban population. We are on the way very quickly to having 60% of all Canadians living in four urban communities. 60%. I think it's about 55 or 56 now. It's rapidly going to go to 60. That is a dramatic change in Canada. That is a great opportunity for the kinds of things that Dan and, uh, and, um, and Chuck were talking about. For over 37 or 38 years, I've found myself walking down Bay Street. And this last, I'm back in Toronto this year after a, a bit of a, a break. And I walk down Bay Street every morning from about Bloor to King. And I just look around me and thinking, how are they doing it? My friend Fernando from City of Toronto is here. And he's been telling me about the really innovative, creative things that are occurring to accommodate this dramatic growth in um, accommodating uh, this development in Toronto. Um, and I want to make the point that I think one of the things we need to do from a policy point of view is explain to policymakers and more importantly to consumers what's on, what the benefits of some of these new possibilities are, and I would volunteer to say to some people, and by the way, a lot of interesting options are not on. Maybe they should be, but they're not going to happen. I, I don't want to really energize the audience, but if you've been in the Toronto, southern Ontario in, area for a while, have you noticed the um, efforts to build some new capacity in Oakville, Mississauga? Have you seen how well that's going? By my count, David can correct me, but we've probably spent, I'm not happy about this, I remember 20 years ago being told we're going to take the coal plants out of places like Lakeview, but we are going to have to do something to accommodate a a shortage, a, a capacity problem we've got there. 20 years later, I think we've probably spent a couple hundred million dollars going in circles. I'm not happy about that. I just cite the factoid as an example of things that you're not going to do in the short and intermediate term. My old electoral district, I had 11 of those cement drapes that we know as hydroelectric dams. The last one was built when I was a graduate student at Queen's University. If anybody thinks, absent real adversity, you're going to build one of those in southern Ontario, I'm prepared to sell tickets. Um, I think there's one being planned, some kind of a power plant is being planned for Bala in the heart of Muskoka. I wish them well. It may happen. But part of the focus on what we need to do is understanding in the short and intermediate term what we're not going to do. And one of the things that most excites me as we urbanize is the fact that we've got these community um, energy systems that seek to integrate not just electricity but the natural gas options that have been talked about with the, with the, with the water as well. Factoid. We Canadians view ourselves as an advanced post-industrial society with a strong environmental conscience. Most people I know do not know that in this society 50% of the energy we produce is heat energy, and we waste 50% of that. Let me repeat. 50% of the energy we produce in this country, this subarctic post-industrial society, is heat energy. Heat energy for industrial purposes, for space and water heating. And we waste 50% of that production. That is clearly not acceptable. It is certainly not efficient. And my friends Dan and Chuck have brought to the table some opportunities as to how we can address that. I make this other observation as someone who spent a lot of time in the town square. Canadians, in my experience, on energy, want, they want security, they want reliability, cost matters. I am very concerned that we've pumped billions of dollars into the cost pipeline that have yet to land on Mr. and Mrs. Front Porch. When they find the true cost of some of what we've been doing, they're going to be impressed that our motivation was good. They may not be impressed by the fact that the, uh, the cost item is as seriously high as it's going to be. But I want to make this point in, in conclusion. There's a lot good happening, especially with the integration of the various supply sources that we've got. And I would say to anyone, especially in the policy space today. You want to talk about community, integrated community energy systems? What are you talking about?
clearly what is the Dick and Jane of that. It's a very compelling, positive, constructive story. Most of the jury has no idea of what you're talking about. Sadly, many of the shareholders in the public corporate, that is the public utilities, don't understand what you're talking about. There are a lot of consumers who would be very excited to know that this kind of innovative work, work is happening. More is possible. My friend Fernando tells me about how that deep water cooling is helping manage this growing air conditioning load south of Bloor, south of St. Clair. That's a good story with real benefit. There's more that we can do. The one lesson I've got from the town square is you want to hope that Mr. and Mrs. Front Porch understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, why other alternatives may not be possible or affordable, and what the real benefits of these integrated community energy systems are to them here in Toronto or Oakville or Ottawa or Lethbridge today and tomorrow, not after they depart this mortal coil. But we are a practical, innovative people. We've got a good story to tell. I think the opportunities are going to be more than fewer in the coming, uh, coming months and uh, delighted to participate in this debate. Thank you very much, John. Well, I think you've, you've heard some really interesting ideas this morning. Are there some good questions or comments? Uh, please. I don't think we have a mic out here for the audience. Do we have a mic that we can pass around? I, it's very hard to hear without a microphone in, in this particular space. So we've got a, we have a mic coming out right here. Here, please. Distinguished former colleague at the legislature, Dr. Wiseman. Thank you, Sean. Uh, my question is, uh, is a technical question. It's something I've been interested in for a long time, and that is hydrogen energy. And um, one of the problems that seems to have, um, that you've alluded to having maybe solved is how do you, how do you uh, control the leakage of hydrogen from the system since hydrogen is such a, uh, a leakable gas in its uh, gaseous state? I guess I'll take a stab at that. Um, uh, while, while hydrogen is a smaller molecule and uh, it, it is more prone to escape than a bigger molecule like methane does, um, it still can be contained with a high degree of safety within the existing uh, pipeline network. Um, particularly in that it would be blended with the methane and become kind of a mixed gas. And that's not something that's new and in fact, um, uh, the origins of Toronto's gas system were from so-called coal gas or town gas, which uh, coal was brought in by barge and gasified. It preceded the Western natural gas industry. And that was a combination of methane and hydrogen. And that was transported uh, and distributed safely uh, at concentrations probably higher than we envisioned through this, this um, mixed gas uh, hydrogen to, to mixed methane uh, through electrolysis kind of program. So uh, we, we think that uh, while it is something that we need to keep an eye on to make sure it's controllable, that the existing piece of infrastructure is probably better than it was back in the days of the, the town gas or coal gas era, and that it could be used effectively for this mixed gas system as it exists today. Another question? Well, maybe I'll just ask a question to keep the ball rolling. Um, uh, Sean has raised a question around public policy and getting the public on side. Um, maybe this is for Chuck and Dan in particular, is are, are there any impediments in the way in terms of policies, uh, regulation or whatever that stands in the way of moving ahead with the kind of innovation that Chuck, you outlined? Is there any concerns in that area? You want to go first? Asking. Okay, well, I'll go first. Um, you know, we kind of respond to the policy initiatives the way they are. Uh, um, you know, as a business guy, you look at the policy environment and you kind of respond to the incentives. As we've done so, for instance, with the solar power. Um, the government has offered meaningful incentives to create solar power, and we've responded to that. Um, and that's my main business rather than the policy formulation. But 
I can't help but think about policy formulation and what would be most efficient. And uh, what we've been advocating uh, is that the government kind of incent the end result that they want. The end result is they want cleaner energy. They want less carbon dioxide. And so incent that, and then let the marketplace decide which technology is most efficient at delivering that end result. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we like solar power, but we also like fuel cells. And right now, it's ironic that there's a very, very big incentive here in the province for solar power, but there is no incentive whatsoever for our fuel cell technology. And in fact, the fuel cell has many advantages over the, uh, the solar power in that it's dispatchable and it's distributable. You can put it right next to our, right next to the load, right next to our, our offices. And yet, uh, sadly, that fuel cell gets the same price as a dirty coal plant does. So we, we think a policy that would make sense was treat all these technologies equally as long as they provide the same result. Let the marketplace let the creativity and the entrepreneurs combined with the businesses decide which solution best provides the end result that, that the, the people want and uh, society needs in, in order to uh, have both the kind of lifestyle that we've grown accustomed to as well as having a, a, a cleaner environment. Dan, did you want to comment on that? You spent a lot of time on policy at yeah, the I, Ethical Association. I think the, um, you know, the barriers that we're working towards are not so much in the technology area. Um, a lot of what we're looking at doing are proven technologies. We're just trying to prove the cost curve of them and demonstrate how they can be integrated into the overall system. So for example, something like um, micro-combined heat and power Again, it's moving towards commercial status. There might be building codes and standards that are in the way, and so we're looking to remove those kinds of barriers with other partners that we work with. Um, renewable natural gas, again, it's, uh, it's something that we're hoping the regulator will identify as, as something that should be allowed. And so as we move to demonstrate the efficiencies and the environmental benefits for these technologies, we hope that the, the regulator and public policy will come behind that and support everything that we're, we're doing because it's, it does make sense in the overall scheme of things to leverage natural gas and the infrastructure that we have. David, I, I just so. make this comment, and I'd say it from my experience as a policy person, one of the things that, that the public out there understands that uh, in this kind of society, this infrastructure is delivering critical services and commodities, absolutely critical. So people want them to work. They, and I became a radical in this when I lived through 15 days of ice storm in my old area, uh, 1998. I had 25,000 people who had no electricity for two weeks in a Canadian winter, a benign winter. That's the day the penny dropped for me. I just thought, uh, I was very pleased to say that it wasn't a failure of public administration or public policy, but it was a very unusual pattern of weather. But the point I really want to make is that let's use the, the, uh, the current environment. And I think that this younger generation particularly wants, and I, and I think we all do, we want to reduce the carbon footprint. We want a, a greener world, and that's entirely laudable. That means, for example, let's take Ontario. Real pressure to make the, uh, the, 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 um, the generation, of, back to well, let's take electricity, greener. So we have made a commitment to um, things like smart grid. It's a good idea. But that's a complicated piece of infrastructure. And I worry sometimes, and I was there myself for too much of the time, there's a great difference between wanting to do something virtuous and actually doing it in a practical, affordable way. If you've ever been in politics, for example, and you go to a neighborhood meeting and you want to turn Brian Armstrong's one-way street uh, into a two-way street, you're going to have several meetings. And most of the politicians know this. With Smart Grid, we actually plan to take a big, a system that has been one way forever into a two-way street in many respects. That's a complicated piece of business, however desirable. Big dollars needed, and you really need to start to change behaviors. Uh, Canadians are a practical people. I think the policymakers have to understand if you're going to do certain things in Canada, you're going to be judged by, well, I hope you've thought through some of the implementation strategies, and you're going to be able to deliver more or less what you promised at more or less the price advertised. Uh, any comments from the audience? Questions? 
right over here. I don't know where the mic is. Disappeared. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's sitting on the chair. Okay, here it comes. I want to thank the participants in the audience for handling our sound system. Here, please. Yes, hello. Uh, very compelling, actually, uh, presentations from, uh, from the panel. Uh, my name is Fernando Carew. I'm with the Energy Efficiency Office in the city of Toronto. Um, Sean, thank you for the plug. Um, the question actually is most, mostly for Dan. Um, Dan, I, I was happy to see actually that uh, uh, integrated community energy systems is one of your main priorities. Uh, and I li I'd like to actually just inject a little bit of the city perspective or the cities, the urban uh, perspective. Because generally when we talk about energy, obviously it's been a uh, provincial jurisdiction. And uh, it's almost a central concept, right? You know, central planning, you know, top down. Great job, by the way. I like my lights and I like you know, my furnace to work and so on, so I'm not knocking that. I think the issue really comes to uh, can we get a bit of a balance? You know, if you look at it from the city's point of view, the city of Toronto actually is undergoing tremendous amount of growth. And we've got actually transmission constraints. So the way we've been dealing with it actually is through conservation mainly, but you cannot conserve your way out of a parking lot turning into a 40 story condo. So it doesn't work. Uh, deep lake water cooling has helped a lot, like uh, Sean mentioned. Uh, 61 megawatts of capacity, which is basically room for another 60 uh, condos, right? Uh, but district energy, the thermal network, the integrated community energy system, you know, Region Park, Waterfront Toronto, what Markham is doing, we see really that actually as economic development. It's a way for us to actually, uh, you know, keep the real estate cycle going, right? And get those parking lots to turn into. Uh, you know, employment and people that spend money in the city and so on. Uh, but what we need to do actually is, uh, you know, help from, from almost the central mode, the central system that we've enjoyed you know, for 100 years, to now pay a little bit of attention, you know, for, on, on the local system. That frankly actually uh, can remove a lot of uh, pressure from the central system. And by the way, actually, it can be just in time deployment of both capital and need where it is without the crystal ball without an, you know, Portland Energy Center being built at $300 million and barely operating a few hundred hours a year. So uh, there's a question in there. Uh, basically, what, how, what do you see actually as you know, sort of, you know, concrete steps to meet cities where they are uh, you know, for integrated community energy systems? Well, that's a, a very open-ended question. You gave a lot of you know, good points in your, uh, in your opening remarks there. Um, I think Toronto is a good example of a city that is actually um, going outside of its, um, you know, the, the typical urban thinking. Um, Toronto's been a leader with uh, N-Wave, both on the district heating side and obviously with the Deep Lake water cooling project. Uh, Toronto's been a leader on the energy efficiency side with the Better Buildings Partnership. So looking at the supply where it's possible of district energy, you're going to really integrate and make use and leverage the, the energy used in the downtown core, which is what it's doing. Um, and I think uh, there needs to be a closer alignment, obviously, between urban planning and energy planning. That's something which is not happening or hasn't happened in the past. I think that that's an area we, we're starting to see Toronto intensify. And as it intensifies, it's going to have to think about building um, new buildings to lead status, integration on the district energy system where it's possible, uh, putting new innovative technologies to use where we can. So I think in all respects, Toronto's on the right path. Having said that, there are many challenges going forward, and that's why we need to look more closely, not just at the smart grid, but at smart energy networks where we can take advantage of both thermal and electric. Sure. Yeah, let me, let me just add a point to that. Um, you know, we talked about um, conservation and I mean, sometimes people think about conservation as simply using less power, right? Riding their bike rather than taking their SUV to the grocery store. But another way of conservation is, is to utilize the existing assets you have more efficiently. And I think one of the things that Toronto and Ontario is going to be a leader in is this, this concept of integrating the electricity system with the natural gas system. And in order to be able to make those two systems complement each other and more efficiently utilize the asset structure that you already have. And, and, and I think that we're on the early stages of that. And I think that has enormous promise for us to be able to, uh, 
to provide the kind of power necessary to keep the new projects going in, in a way that um, uh, utilizes the existing infrastructure to be able to do that. And, uh, and I think Toronto and Ontario is going to be a leader in that space. On the basis of that comment, I'm afraid we've got a break because the minister's announcement and, and Sean is expected over for it as am I, so I'm going to have to end it here. But that's a great way to end it. Uh, Dan, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, you did a great job. I, it was really interesting to hear the new work that you've undertaken as part of the Energy Technology Innovation Canada. And good luck on that. Thank it you sounds very, very promising. Chuck, uh, I thought your message was very hopeful. We've got one of Canada's major energy infrastructure companies taking a real interest in innovation. And I think uh, you, you gave us a really good outline of what that's going to entail. And it's congratulations. What wonderful efforts you're doing in that regard. And Sean, thank you once again for alerting us to Mr. and Mrs. Front Porch and the need for us <laughs> to be conscious of that as we do all these deep things and deep thoughts and all the things we're going to do. Thank you all very much for, for your Thanks, being with us today. Thank you.